On quite a few occasions recently, I've read stories about the old American West, the frontier, and the conquest of new lands, and the battles between newcomers and Native Americans, and the results have been somewhat mixed, I must admit. Not all of these stories have gone down that well, but, well, tonight I'm confident you're going to love this one. Wow. Another one from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read the stories that you sent to me back to all of you. This one's a real humdinger. Well, my dear friends, are you ready? It's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The 27th of July, 1901. It was confirmed by my doctor today. My father is on his deathbed. It's odd to see a man I've spent my whole life imagining made of stone and iron being as soft as clay. When he received the news, I could see his hardened face sag, and I left the room despairing the embarrassment of having his son see him cry. His whole life, he's been strong, and our family is no stranger to misfortune, but not once did he express his grief so openly. Normally, a man like him would call for another doctor, but living near Pinos Altos in New Mexico, we're lucky to have the one doctor that can reach our farmhouse within a day. The next closest place to that will be Las Cruces, and that's over a day's ride away. Besides, Dr. Murphy is a trusted friend and has proven his medical prowess time and time again. <sighs> My whole family trusts him, and it would be an insult to him if my father asked for a second opinion. Time passed after the news had been given. I was busy doing repairs on our barn. Our property goes right into a mountain, so sometimes rocks from high up tumble down the hill and damage our property and animals. I just finished patching a hole that had been created in the roof when my younger sister, Abigail, came to me and told me my father wanted to talk. Normally, I would try to find an excuse to delay our conversation, but now that his death was certain, it didn't feel right to make him wait, so I immediately made my way to his bedroom. My father and I do not see eye to eye on many things. Though we operate a farm, my father has miners' blood in him, while I have always had a thirst for knowledge and the drive to invent new things. I would not call myself weak, but in his prime, father could carry 300 pounds on his back and walk for miles. In short, I am the polar opposite of him, and I know in my heart that he believes that the real misfortune of the tragedies that befell my older brothers, God rest their souls, is that it happened to them and not to me. I entered my father's bedroom and took a seat on the chair next to his bed. Though he was proclaimed a dying man, you couldn't see it yet. He sat up straight in bed. His face returned to its usual stony appearance. He was staring at the mantle over his fireplace, at the clump of unrefined gold ore that adorned the shelf. He had told everyone that the ore had been passed to him from his father, and he planned to make it a family heirloom. When I sat down, he looked at me thoughtfully. I looked away on instinct, as whenever he glanced at me, his eyes were filled with scorn and judgment. When he didn't say anything, I dared to steal a glance at his face and saw soft eyes looking me up and down. After he was satisfied looking at me, he leaned over and opened a drawer by his bedside table. He took out a letter that looked like it had been written some time ago. It still remained sealed in the envelope. Son, I need you to take this letter to the Mescalero Reservation. I know not their name, but tell the natives they are looking for the tribe that followed Mangas Colorados. Find their leader and give him this letter. If he needs you to read it to him, do so. If he needs a translator, find one and pay for their services. Whatever happens, he needs to know what is in this letter as soon as possible. You write out tonight. I was in shock as I left the room and began my preparations to travel father hated the natives with all his soul. I didn't know much, but I did know that the land we owned used to belong to the Apaches. 
My grandfather had come here during the 1860s, during the gold rush that happened in Pinos Altos, and had a very successful mine. It had been successful when he died, and my father took over. But before I'd been born, the mining operation just stopped, and we were forced to become farmers. When my father was drunk, he would sometimes let slip that he not only blamed the deaths of my two older brothers on the Apaches, but the drying up of the mine as well. Now, he suddenly had a letter that needed to be delivered post-haste to his sworn enemies. It was all very confusing. The 30th of July, 1901. It was a day's ride to the reservation. I'd started in the late afternoon on the 27th, rode into the night, camped out, and continued riding at first light. Luckily, I had no run-ins with anything to impede my journey, so I arrived late in the afternoon on the 28th. I could see the reservation on the horizon, and as I drew closer, I saw the sorry state that it was in. My father hates the native Indians, but I do not share his animosity. I saw men, women, and children suffering in poverty, pity and guilt being the only feelings occupying my soul. I am a student of history, and I know the truth behind the backwards dealings the United States government did with the native tribes. I could not blame the many hate-filled stares I was given, nor defend myself against them. Still, I was welcomed by a group of natives that could speak English very well, and was asked what my business there was. I relayed to my greeters my name and my father's name, asking them to take me to the leader of Mangas Colorado's tribe. I was told they would be found, and that I could wait in the town hall for them. I thanked them and made my way to the town hall. Along the way, I saw more of the devastating conditions of the reservation, which made my heart ache. I hadn't much money on my person, but the few who came to me begging, I gave what I could. I'd expected more beggars, but the Apache are a proud people, and I was sure that there were still elders around who had fought off white settlers from their land, and anyone caught begging from a white man for money would receive a scolding at the very least. After an hour or so waiting in the town hall, a young man with four older men, one very old indeed, entered the town hall and greeted me. The young man, who spoke English perfectly, told me that the United States government had thrown together many different tribes of Apache when they created this reservation. The four older men was the Council of Wise Men, though officially they held no power, and the young man was the descendant of the Chief Victorio. I guessed that this was going to be the closest situation I was going to get with the parameters my father had set, so I gave the young man the letter. The five men read the letter with curiosity, and when finished, they engaged in fevered discussion in their own language for a few minutes. I can neither speak nor read Apache, but it looked like two of the older men were very adamant about something, while the other two and the young man were calm but no less resistant on their point of view. Finally, it came to a head, and the angry men seemed to cave. Satisfied, the young man turned back to me and gave me a genuine smile. Tell your father our envoy shall be there in a week, and they shall judge if what is being offered is equal repayment. I merely stared at him, bewildered. I'm sorry, I said, but he hasn't told me anything. Do we owe you money? Because if so, i will be willing to draw up a contract. The young man interrupted me. You do not need to know the details. Your father's history with us is his, and yours is yours. It would be best for you to simply tell him our response, and let him and us deal with each other. If he dies before we arrive, we will tell you our history, and the responsibility will be on you. He then told me that my horse had been given water and feed, and bid me a polite but insistent goodbye. When I got back home the following day and told father their response, I could see cold fury build in his eyes. I knew then for sure he was dying, as the anger gave way to rasping coughs, and then a look of defeat. He thanked me and told me to go about my daily chores. In all my life, I'd never seen him act this way. 
I begged him to tell me what was going on, but he refused. If this relationship we have with the natives is not resolved with their visit, then I will tell you. He went quiet after that. I knew it was best to get on with my chores. The 3rd of August, 1901. Something happened last night that has shaken my family to the core. I know not fully the sins my mother and father are guilty of, but they did not deserve what has occurred. Abigail is asleep on my bed as I write this in the dark of night, as she is too afraid to sleep on her own. I do not blame her, for even though I am a man of science, I cannot explain what has taken place, and it has shaken me to my very core. Our farm is not massive, but it's not small by any means. As such, there are a few acres that are not dedicated to crop growth. These acres are inhabited by rocks, weeds, the graves of my two older brothers, and an old mine entrance into the mountains. My sister and I have been forbidden to go near since the time we learned our first words. I suspect that the entrance is the opening to the mine our family ran when grandfather settled here, but neither father nor mother have ever confirmed it. Early this morning, as I was helping our few farmhands tilling the many small fields we have, I heard a scream of terror I knew was from Abigail. It was coming from the direction of the old mine, behind some hills near the back of our property. My eldest brother was killed near there seven years ago from a mountain lion attack, and so I wasted no time rushing to try and find her, clutching my garden hoe tightly. I'd rather die than let anything happen to Abigail. I rushed over the hills and soon caught sight of my sister. She was sitting on the ground, a basket of eggs dropped and forgotten by her side. Her fear-filled scream, being combined now with sobs of despair, as she was openly crying. She appeared uninjured, thank God, and when she heard me running up to her, she got to her feet and practically leapt into my arms. She stopped screaming, but was shaking all over and weeping hysterically. I stroked her hair and was about to ask her what was wrong, when out of the corner of my eye I saw something, and my blood ran cold. What the farmhands and my parents saw when they arrived was bad enough. At the entrance to the dark abyss that led into the mountains stood two mummified corpses. I can't understand what allowed them to stand on their own two feet, but there they were. Each had their arms open in a welcoming gesture, each dry, grey, eyeless face stretched into a devilish smile. Their smiles were filled with teeth fashioned from gold, making their grins a dirty yellow seem even more horrid than had their real rotten teeth still been intact. One had clearly been in the ground longer than the other, as its clothing was slightly more worn and dirtier. Even with age and mummification, however, I still recognize the corpses of my two older brothers, one with its shredded clothes from when he'd been killed during the mountain lion attack. What no one but my sister and I saw, though, was the chicken. It had escaped the coop while Abigail had been feeding them, and she'd tried to catch it before it went too far. That was the whole reason she was near the entrance to the mine at all. She later told me, what had made her scream wasn't the unearthed corpses of our brothers, but that a tendril of blackness had slid out of the mine and grabbed the chicken as it ran past. I myself didn't see any eldritch appendage coming from the mine, but I did catch a glimpse of the chicken, trying to free itself in vain from something in the darkness of the entrance, before being sucked into the encompassing blackness with a final squawk of fear and pain. Something was living in the mountain behind our home. My mother fainted at the sight of my two brothers' bodies displayed as they were. My father, who had been helped out of bed and into the field by a farmhand, contorted his face into a combination of blind fury and abject terror. If I had not been busy comforting my sister, I would have probably shared his sentiment. I'm not a religious person by any means, but the fact that someone would defile my brother's rest like that sparked a primal fury in my soul. While my sister, who had calmed down somewhat, and father 
tried to resuscitate my mother, the farmhands and I went to investigate the graves of my brothers. The ground had not been disturbed. From the service, they looked like they'd been there for the past few years. It was suggested by one of the help that maybe the corpses weren't my brothers, but I knew better. I ordered their coffins to be unearthed, so we started digging. It didn't take long, and we discovered a curious sight. Their coffins were both smashed and broken, with no bodies inside. It seemed that whatever unhallowed their bodies took them from underground, and somehow brought them above ground to be contorted as they were. Later that night, with an afternoon spent constructing new coffins and reburying my brothers, I confronted father with my findings. He merely nodded, and went back to staring at the lit fireplace in his bedroom. I was at my breaking point. I can endure a lot of things, but being in the dark about a situation is not one of them. I asked him directly if the Apache had been the ones who disrupted my brother's sleep. My father began. Not them, directly, but because of them. He stopped suddenly, and went very quiet for a while, before finally finishing with... No, it's not because of them. I should have listened when I had the chance. I asked pointedly what was going on, but my father just shook his head. I will tell you when the business with the Apache is done. All I can tell you now is that once you know the truth, you will wish for ignorance again. The 4th of August, 1901. My world has been shattered. So many of the things I thought were truth have been exposed as lies all in one day. My future prospects look grim, and I have no one except my own family to take the blame for it. I feel tired, depressed, and angry all at once. It is a chore to recount the events that took place today, but I feel that I must, if only to help get my feelings and thoughts straight. If what was told to me is fact, then my journal shall also be a warning to all those who read it. The morning began with the arrival of the Apache envoy in a covered wagon. There were twelve men in total, including the five men who I had met a week ago. My mother and I greeted them and offered food and water for their horses and breakfast and coffee for the men. They politely refused the breakfast and coffee, but gladly accepted the nourishment for their horses. While two farmhands took care of the steeds and wagon, Mother and I led the group to Father's bedroom. He'd managed to get himself dressed, and was sitting at a small table near the fireplace, which had also managed to light. It must have been a tremendous strain on him, for though he was displaying himself as healthy, I could tell he was sitting up purely on willpower. Father greeted the men, and asked Mother and I to close the door and wait in the living room until their discussion was over. He promised this wouldn't take long, with a forced smile, before adorning a gruff and determined face for the natives. We fulfilled his request, and I found myself playing cards with my sister in the living room, while Mother busied herself in the kitchen, baking my father's favorite apple pie. For about ten minutes, the men were quiet in their discussions, a few times I heard a raised muffle that I knew was my father disagreeing with something, but nothing was too heated. Shortly thereafter, I heard the first shouts, and soon the twelve men exited his bedroom and silently left the house. Father tried to follow after, but only had enough strength to reach the doorframe of his bedroom. As the last native was exiting through the front door, he managed to roar, My sons are buried here and I will be buried here. We aren't leaving for nothing. Curious, I looked out the front window. The Apache was slowly making their way to the barn. I was worried they planned to make off with our tools and some animals, so I went to the cabinet where we kept our guns. Father stopped me with a gruff, leave them to their work. Confused, I went back to the window. Nothing moved outside for a minute or two. But then the Apache were exiting the barn with what looked like rocks of different sizes. Some were big enough that two or three people were required to carry them. 
To satisfy my inquiring mind, I stepped outside and walked to the now big pile of rocks. As soon as I got close, I knew what they were immediately. Chunks of unrefined gold ore. I stared in amazement, for this amount of gold would have allowed our family to live in luxury for generations. Yet this was all hidden somewhere in the barn. I'd known that something was odd with our farm's economics for a while, as there was no way the little crops and household goods we produced could keep our business going, but never had I thought we were sitting on this much hidden wealth. After a few more minutes, it seemed all the gold was taken, and the Apache began loading it into their wagon. The young man who was a descendant from Chief Victorio came to me. Your father is very close to death, so I will tell you this in case he does not have the chance or decides not to. His face was serious, but had a touch of general concern in it. As I said last time we spoke, your father's history with us is his, and yours is yours, and so I warn you. Your misfortune is yours alone when you leave our sacred land. The debt to us has been repaid, but the darkness who dwells in the mountains only takes blood as repayment. If you stay here, will bring about the ruin of your family. Another Apache called to the young man, and he left my side to help load the ore, as I stood in wonder at what I'd just been told. Soon the Apache were finishing loading the wagon, and were on their way back home, chanting something in their native language as they did. I watched them go silently, and once their covered wagon vanished from my view, I marched straight back to the house. I was going to find out what the hell was going on, and I wasn't going to accept any excuses any more. My father had managed to get back into his bedclothes, and back into bed when I arrived in his room. His eyes were watching the door as I came in, as though he was expecting me. Before I could get a word in edgewise, he motioned to a chair beside the bed and told me to take a seat. Stunned, I did as he asked without protest. He took a few moments to gather himself, and with a deep breath, he began to tell his tale. As you know, your grandfather came to New Mexico from New York in 1865. He'd heard the tales of the gold rush that occurred here in Pinos Altos in 1860, and since the Union had just won the Civil War and was in desperate need for money, he thought it was a perfect time to come. Plus... There were more troops here now that the fighting in the east was done, so he believed it was a lot safer. Selling his land and almost all his possessions, my father and mother traveled all the way out here and settled in the town during spring. You and your grandfather are a lot alike, you know. Though he came from a poor family, my father made sure that he was a well-read and educated man, so when he arrived, he knew of the plight of the native Apaches, and was aware of past mistreatment of them from both the Mexican and United States governments. He decided to mix his sympathies for them with his natural business cunning, and came up with a plan to benefit not only him, but the Apaches as well. In the light of day, he put on the appearance of any other prospector living here, trying to find the reserves of gold and silver by himself while fearing Indian attacks. At night, however, he met the Apaches and worked out a deal with them. He reasoned they knew where gold and silver veins were to be found, since this was their land. As we told them, he would be a middleman for them in the United States. The plan was that they would deliver him gold ore, and he would trade supplies like bullets and coffee to them. Then he would claim the gold was found by him, sell it to the government, and give the Apache 20% of his earnings. I don't know how he did it, but your grandfather was a silver-tongued devil. The Apache agreed to the deal, and very soon your grandfather was smelting and selling some of the purest gold that had been found in this country. For a while, our family had the perfect situation. We saved money on mining equipment and miners, since we didn't do any mining. Since both the Apaches and my father were as good as their word, we had a steady supply of gold to sell, and they were making a decent profit. I grew up watching this. As the years passed, the sin of greed took root in my soul. 
when your grandfather made me partner in the company that had sprung up around our success. I started siphoning off profit to a private account. When your grandfather caught pneumonia and died in the early spring of 1873, that was when I made my move. After being the sole head of our mining and smelting operation, I knew I had to find where the Apaches were getting this steady stream of gold all over all these years. Well, it took some time, but I managed to find an Indian who was willing to sell out his tribe for a large amount of cash. I paid him, and he led me to here. This very land we walk on now. I knew our rise to even further riches had finally come. With the rest of my private account's assets, I played the game of politics and had enough to win influence in President Grant's cabinet. With my leverage, I managed to get Grant to create the Mescalero Reservation in May of 1873. Once that was done, I wasted no time in driving the remaining Apache from here. I hired a group of Pinkertons, rode out to where the Apache were camped. I had no thoughts of violence in my mind, only intimidation. When we arrived, it seemed they'd known we were coming, as most of their camp was taken down and they were ready for travel. I informed them of the new reservation created by President Grant, I told them if they were going anywhere, that the reservation would be their safe and legal destination. I was only given hateful stares in return. Before the tribe left, an old medicine man and young woman approached our armed group, unafraid of the multitudes of armed men behind me. Using the woman as a translator, the medicine man told me he knew who I was and what I had planned. He told me that there was a darkness that dwelled in the mountains. He said that the darkness claimed everything in the mountain as its own, and that the tribe had made deals with it for the gold ore they supplied to us. Now that I'd broken ties with the tribe and forced them from their homes, the darkness would look to me to fulfill the bargains they had made. Well, I dismissed the old man as crazy, and once I was sure the natives were gone from this region, I built our home here. Our barn was originally a storage and processing plant for the ore we were going to uncover. I did not think of this land as anything but a gold-filled treasure trove. I never imagined this place to be where the raising of my family would take place. When we first entered the mountain, we found we didn't need to do any drilling or blasting. There was a natural series of caves that led deep underground. At first, we found nothing, but about two miles in, we were in awe of the amount of gold veins running through the walls. There was so much of it, and the rock was so soft you could almost pull the gold from the walls itself. I knew then I was going to become one of the richest men in America, and immediately began excavating the tunnels. It was about a year after I established the mine and started employing people from town that, well, I met your mother. Until then, I thought only wealth was my sole motivation in this world. But when I set eyes on her, I knew immediately that the money I'd acquired for myself meant nothing, and that its sole purpose was to bring about her happiness. Your mother changed me for the better. She saw past my greed and ambition, and made me pay my workers better, and make the mine safer than it was. I did everything, she asked, and in only a few months, we were married. For three years, we were the happiest people alive. She had delivered to me a son, your oldest brother, and the mine seemed to have an endless amount of gold. I was far more religious then, and thanked God every day for the plentiful bounty that he had blessed me with. I shared my wealth with the town, and employed almost half of it. With all my prosperity, I made the foolish mistake of never thinking back on the Apaches and what I'd done to them, nor of their warning to me when they were forced from their home. This would soon be the reason for our family's downfall. The fifth year our mine was open, strange things started happening. Equipment left in the mine began disappearing, at first, it was minor things. Some pickaxes, a few lanterns. Then a box of dynamite went missing. And I had to start taking things much more seriously. I put guards in front of the mine every night, and yet still things went missing inside. After no one was seen entering or exiting the mine with any of the missing items, I figured someone must still be in the mine, hiding out and surviving off rations they bought with them when they first sneaked in. 
This is when the Apaches re-entered my mind. I began to think that a few of them had sneaked in and were doing their best to muddle up my operations as a way of revenge. I had planned to go to the reservation to talk, and maybe do more than talk if they said some things I didn't like. Your mother convinced me otherwise, and I ended up arming a group of men and going into the mine to look for those responsible for the thefts. I hadn't been in the mine since the first time I'd entered those four years ago. It somehow was darker and more hostile than when I'd first entered the mountain. I had ten armed men behind me, however, and the fear I felt was only in the back of my mind. The only worry that I was concentrating on was the worry that the thieves were armed and dangerous, especially since they had a box of dynamite. Slowly, lighting the lanterns that lit the walls as we went, our group began its trek into the inside of the mountains. By this point in time, my men had really began digging deep into the roots of the mountain. We traveled slowly and silently, checking every alcove we came across to make sure that there wasn't someone hiding in the pitch black. Apache are dangerous fighters, and even ten men could fall very quickly to a surprise attack from only a couple of Apache warriors. So we went carefully, as no one wanted their last minutes alive spent in the deep, dark earth before taking a knife in the back. Time passed, and we encountered no one. We eventually made it to the most recent cavern that was created by my men, and that housed a large vein of gold. There was some confusion among the men, as none of them could recognize this man-made room. They knew they'd made it, but it was different from when they'd left it just a day earlier. It was much bigger, with the ceiling rising into the darkness high enough that our light sources could not illuminate the top. Our posse had spent some time looking over a map of the mines, trying to plan our next move, when something seemed off. We looked around the room, but nothing seemed out of place. It was then we noticed that one of the men was missing. We didn't know how this could have happened, as all of us were sure that everyone had stayed together and had entered this large room at the same time. With curses and calls for his name, our group split up and searched for him, even more cautious than we'd been before. The man I was with was named Henry Cassinger. He was a good man, a hard worker, and had a lovely family. To this day, I am glad that he was the man I was paired with, for it was his keen eyes and cunning brain that allowed me to make it out of that unholy blackness alive. Wherever he is now, I can only pray that life has been kind to him. Henry and I, we were checking the passageways about a mile from the back of the big room our group had been in when they first heard the screams. They weren't the type of screams one would utter when a brawl was happening, or even on a battleground where the dead and dying pile around you, on the roar of cannons assault your ears. No, oh, the wails were those that sailors describe in their tall tales of watery horror. Screams of the lost and damned. Screams of those who pray for death. Yet death does not come. They were the screams of the souls that suffered through hell on earth. Just as quickly as they come, they vanished, as though a door had been slammed and their cries were muffled. Henry and I looked at each other in stunned silence as the echoes of the other groups of men reached our ears, asking what had happened and was everyone all right. A rotten stench had filled the air, like centuries-old decay and grime and death had been disturbed and now filled the air with its poisonous stench. I was about to respond to the cries of the other groups when Henry shushed me and waited with bated breath to what would happen next. The screams came again, this time closer, and Henry and I began running, our instinct taking over our minds. The shrieks followed us, combining with the terror-filled shouts of the rest of the groups trying to escape just like us. As we ran through the dimly lit tunnels, we could tell one by one that the groups were being attacked by whatever lived in the gloom as their shouts of alarm and panic became warped into those of screams of damned souls before being snuffed out like a light. As Henry and I made it to a large intersection of tunnels that marked our closeness to the surface, I stupidly decided to look back the way we'd come. For an instant, there was nothing except rock wall and support columns that were lit up from the lanterns. Then, 
an oozing blackness covering all surfaces of the tunnel came from around a corner, swallowing everything in the inky abyss that was itself. The sight of this infernal thing caused my breath to catch in my throat, and my eyes were so distracted by this abysmal mass that they didn't see the rock pile in front of me, and I tripped and fell. I knew doom in that instant, as the engulfing darkness crept closer. I was about to let out the very screams my fellow men had before their fates had been sealed, when Henry came back for me. With one arm, he pulled me to my feet, and with the other he reached into his pocket and flung whatever he had in there at the all-encompassing mass. It turned out to be a pocket full of coins. His throw had been hasty and weak, made with his offhand while he concentrated on lifting me from the ground. The coins clattered to the cave floor weakly in front of the conglomeration of filth and evil, and yet it stopped. For an instant, we saw a small tendril from the main clump of blackness reach out and daintily pick up the coins one by one, as though it was a man who had found loose change on the ground, and happily retrieved them as though it was his lucky day. Henry broke our gaze with a loud hurrah, and we took off, running faster than we'd ever run in our lives before. This time I did not make the mistake of looking back until our bodies passed the threshold of the entrance, and we were bathed in pale moonlight on the dusty ground, and our lungs sucked in greedily the clean open air. After a few gasps of the sweet light air, I dared to turn around, to see if the devil who had doggedly pursued us would leave its lair to claim two final victims. At first, I thought the blackness that filled the void of the mine's entrance was that of the natural sort. But after staring at it for a few seconds, I realized that it was too thick, too solid to be the simple lack of light. I felt then that Henry and I were safe, as the writhing shade did not seem to be able to leave the entrance and exit the mountain. But the abomination wasn't through with us yet, and gave us a final taunt that has haunted my dreams every night to this very day. Eyes appeared from the darkness, not eyes that one would imagine a demon or beast of the night would have, no, human eyes, of different colors and ages, all spaced unevenly throughout the blackness, never any in a pair. Next came the smiles. They were made of teeth taken from different mouths, all turned into terrible grins you might see on the face of a killer in love with his work. Then came the most terrible jeer of all. Bodies, with their skin all taken off, missing their eyes and teeth, crawled from the darkness. Each was moaning in abject suffering, and all of them were trying to get away from the black mass. But I could see that, attached to every limb that moved, was a tentacle of eldritch origin, tying the poor man to the pitch blackness. Just when it seemed the men, my men, who I had the pleasure of talking to and working with just hours before, were finally about to break free, the abhorrent creature pulled them back into itself, allowing one final screech from each man before disappearing into the thing. From the depth of my memory, the words of the medicine man floated into my mind then. The darkness claims everything in the mountain as its own. Once the entity went back to the depths of the mountain, Henry quit right there and then. I couldn't blame him. I would have done the same thing if I was in his position. I walked back to your mother in the house, I wrapped my arm around her and your eldest brother. I knew then and there the mining company was doomed. But I had enough gold ore that I'd secreted away so that we would live comfortably and I had my family and my life. I needed nothing more, especially since it was clear to me where my sin of greed had led me. The darkness in the mountain wasn't done with our family yet, though. For years it waited having the men it devoured occasionally call out to me in the night, begging for me to help them escape, or cursing me for leaving them to their fate. It never wandered from the accursed doorway that traversed its pitch-black home, but anything that went too near the entrance, 
at the risk of being swallowed up. And that is the true fate of your eldest brother. I had warned him about the mine, but never told him the truth of what lurked in there. It wasn't a mountain lion that tore him to sheds, and I should feel blessed I was able to recover his body at all. After a few more years, it turned its sights on my second son. He was a good lad, and loved the farming lifestyle. I told you and your sister he died of a snake bite, but the truth is far worse. He was digging a well when he accidentally went too deep and connected to part of the mine. I tried to get a rope to him, but even in the middle of the afternoon sun, the black filth poured into the pit he was standing in, and in less than a minute, he was swallowed up by the gloom. I suppose I again should feel blessed. It left me a body to bury. By now, the sun had set, and the night sent eerie shadows dancing across the room from the light of the dying fireplace. I could only stare at Father as he finished recounting this tale of loss, trying to wrap my head around his words. He looked at me again, his eyes the eyes of a broken man. We did try moving once, before I paid the Apache back, but it didn't work. When I was in Les Cruces, finding a nice house for us, I passed by a sewer grate during dusk. From the grate I heard whispering, and looking into it, I saw the eyes of my men again, staring back at me, and one huge smile, filled with too many teeth for a human mouth. It would follow me wherever I went. He covered his face with his hands, and for a moment, I thought he was going to cry. After a few moments, he managed to compose himself and looked at me determinedly. I have no plans on leaving this land alive. I'll be buried here with your brothers. I look to you to move the family off this blasphemous mountain. Even with our reserves of gold gone, we have enough saved to get a modest house somewhere. Anywhere but here. Besides, you're a smart man. Smarter than me in more ways than one. I trust your judgment and have no doubt you'll lead us to prosperity once again. A coughing fit silenced Father, and I stayed by its side until it subsided. He seemed exhausted, so I excused myself and began to leave. Before I made it out of the door, he called me softly. I know you're a man of science. You probably don't believe the story I just told you. Or well, you believe that there are explanations to the terrors I went through. Well, there was a gas leak in the mine. Your brother was killed by a cougar living in the mines. Well, it wasn't the darkness, but oil which swallowed up my son. I wish those were true, but they aren't. Now the darkness is tempting you to go into the mountain. Resist it. There still may be gold in those tunnels, but it belongs to the darkness. Only a true fool would venture into those mines. The 7th of August, 1901. We buried Father today, next to my brothers. A lot of people from town showed up for the funeral, as Father did employ many of the townsfolk when the mine was open, and did help with the prosperity of the region for a time. I could tell that everyone from town made a conscious effort not to look towards where the mine entrance was located, hidden behind a few hills. It seems odd to me that so many of the Christian faith believe in a creature from Apache folklore. I guess it's easier to call something you'd understand a demon and let it stay like that, rather than trying to uncover the truth. Father did have some money saved away, but alas, it is not enough. We certainly can move from this land, which both Mother and Abigail wish to do, but it's certainly not enough for us to live comfortably. We need another source of income, just temporarily, so that I can attend college and support us with a career that requires a degree. There's an item patented by Louis P. Haslett from Louisville that claims it can protect one's lungs from harmful particles in the air. This inhaler, or lung protector, that I have ordered will allow me to trip into the mine to retrieve a sack of gold ore without exposing myself to the harmful gas that was the cause of father's nightmarish hallucinations. I'll be able to retrieve a sack of gold ore, enough to secure my family's future, 
and I may even be able to locate the bodies of the original team that went with Father, so they may be recovered and given a proper burial. I am a man of science, and don't believe in spirits and demons and things that go bump in the night. I'm sure just one trip into the mountains will be worth the rewards it reaps. So like I said, that's a theme I've been uh, doing on and off for a few weeks now, and um, well, I really like that one, but <laughs> I like all the stories I read. Not that you all do, but well, what are you going to do? That's the beauty of Dr. Creepin's World, isn't it? You never quite know what you're going to get. Well, another long one for a Monday evening. Hope that helped pass the time pleasantly and joyfully for you all. <laughs> and of course, I will be back again very soon. Um, a few of you are waiting on the continuation of some series, so let me know what you're waiting for, and um, I'll get back to it as soon as possible, maybe even on Wednesday. But for now, that's all for me. Just leaves me to say one more thing. Sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?